What if there's a way to take home an additional fifteen to forty thousand dollars per year? In this episode of Driven Too Far: The Truth About Trucking, we'll show you how to choose the right truck for a lease purchase program. Hello, I'm Andrew Winkler, and this is Driven Too Far: The Truth About Trucking, a podcast that helps over-the-road truck drivers balance career and family. Are you thinking about jumping into a lease purchase program with your trucking company? If you are, there's a few things you should consider before doing so. For instance, what kind of truck should you choose? Uh, in our instance, we do a lot of education with our lease purchase guys. Uh, many times they're coming from a company uh, background and they want to take the first step into a lease purchase program. We take time to educate them and we do a lot of different things in our program. And the first is we put them through some online training. It's about a 12 hour course. It's kind of a business 101 type thing, if you will. Uh, just tries to change their mindset a little bit from uh, being that company driver where everything's really paid for and taken care of for you over to a small business operator where all of a sudden you have to start thinking just a little bit different about your expenses. Uh, another thing we do with uh, the education piece is we, we bring them in for a half-day workshop, uh, and it may be just one person in that workshop, or we may have several drivers uh, taking the workshop at the same time. Uh, but one of the, I, I, we always get to the point we start talking about expenses and managing the money and fuel costs obviously is one of your biggest expenses as a lease operator. So we, we spend quite a bit of time on that. And one of the things we get into is um, what kind of truck should I buy? Uh, in our case, we run three different models in our fleet. Uh, we run the, the Freightliner Cascadia which I'm sure is uh, probably not a big surprise to anybody. That's kind of the workhorse of the industry, if you will. It's seen as a fleet type truck, and there's a good reason for that. The other two trucks we run are both Peterbilt's. Uh, the 579 model, if you know what that is, it's an aerodynamic model, really sharp looking truck. Peterbilt just redesigned that in the last uh, two years, I believe. So we spec them out. They've got chrome on them. They've got stacks, uh, just super sharp trucks, but they still have that aerodynamic style to help with fuel mileage. The other truck we run in the fleet is called a Peterbilt 567, and that's a little bit more unfamiliar to some people what that truck looks like. Uh, it was originally designed as a vocational truck for Peterbilt, so you might have seen that truck uh, with a dump body on it for like a dump truck or maybe a concrete mixer or something like that. But I think at some point Peterbilt figured out that if they put a sleeper on this truck, it actually had some likeness to the very popular 389 long nose. The 579 Peterbilt and the 567 Peterbilt that we run, they both share the exact same cab. So the interior is exactly the same, the dash layout, the sleepers, everything like that. The change with the trucks is the hood. Uh, the 579, as I mentioned, is aerodynamic, and the 567 is just a little bit more boxy. It has a square nose on it. It has a little bit of slope to the hood, but it also uses the same headlights uh, off the 389 Peterbilt. So it gives the appearance that it's a, a little bit longer nose truck, even though it isn't. Now, the big difference between those two Peterbilts is the aerodynamics and the fuel mileage they get. When we think about the big, beautiful trucks out on the road, a lot of times we think about the Freightliner Classic, the Peterbilt 389, the Kenworth W900, and there's just something about the chrome and the stacks, uh, and it does something to us. If, if you've got trucking in your blood or diesel in your blood, you're just drawn to those kind of trucks, and I, and I think we all are, because for whatever reason, it's like you see those out there, and you associate that type of truck with success. So you see somebody driving a big, beautiful W9 that's all chromed out and, and the paint job's fantastic. Maybe they've got a trailer to match. You know, the first thing you're thinking is like, man, look what that guy's got. He's really got his act together and he's done something right over the years to be able to get to that kind of truck. The challenge with that kind of thought process is that there's, there's just something with those long nose trucks, uh, the classic look to them and stuff. Uh, they, they really help, they pump up our ego and, and we wanna be a part of that. So here's a question for you. How many large fleets do you see out there that run these long nose, square nose, classic looking trucks? 
And I bet you're going to have uh, difficulty thinking of any um, because the reality is most of those fleets have gone broke. And there's a reason for that. And that's the, the fuel economy in the truck and what it costs to operate those trucks. Now, you might find uh, some smaller carriers that can uh, can afford to operate those type of trucks. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to warn you a little bit. There's a good chance that anybody that's operating those kind of trucks is probably going to try to lease those back to a driver because as soon as they do that, they're no longer responsible for the fuel bill to operate that kind of truck. They put it back on that driver and they're appealing to our egos, um, you know, our sense of pride and, and everything we want to be as drivers. We want we, we all want trucks like that and they know that. So just be cautious with that. It's easy to really get sucked in to a lease purchase program like that. Um, again, the ego and and the sense of pride that comes along with operating, you know, a piece of equipment that looks like that is amazing. Uh, but just make sure you understand that you're probably the person that's going to be uh, footing the fuel bill on that. So be cautious. When we go through the class and we're talking about fuel mileage and some of those more important points. I joke around a little bit with some of the guys that go through it, and it says, you know, what what truck are you going to pick? Are you going to pick the 567 or the the 579? Or or if money wasn't an object, what kind of truck would you like to drive? And, and a lot of them would say maybe that 389 Peterbilt or that W900 uh, Kenworth, the big fancy trucks. And while I'm I'm like that as well, I like nice things. And, and if I had dollars and money wasn't an object, I would probably pick something like that as well. But the problem is those types of truck, that styling really comes at a cost. And it comes at a cost to you as a small business owner. Uh, there's a couple different ways it's probably going to impact you. First of all is the overall cost of the truck. What is it? worth new what's it going to do to your weekly or monthly truck payments so you have to look at that when you have a truck like those long nose uh, fancy trucks uh, the the retail value of that truck when it's new maybe it's two hundred and twenty five thousand maybe two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a new truck so you have to think about what is that going to do to my insurance cost for that truck because insurance would be valued at the retail value or the market value of that truck. So your insurance is also going to be higher in that style of truck. The biggest cost you're going to have with these types of trucks is probably the, the fuel and fuel economy you're going to get. So this goes back several years ago, and I think about when telematics first started coming into the trucks, and this is the satellite systems, maybe the Qualcomm's, things like that. When we brought that technology into the trucks, all of a sudden, we in the back office, we could start to see fuel mileage, instant fuel mileage from the trucks, and we could run reports. We could compare the different trucks in the fleet and how they were doing. And I distinctly remember at the time, uh, it, it was new and we were excited about the idea of being able to see how these trucks were performing. I had printed out a report for our fleet at the time, and that actually included some of the owner operators we had in our fleet. Uh, I wasn't really thinking, and, and I posted the, the report on, in the front entrance of the, the trucking company on the bulletin board so everybody could come in and kind of see where they lined up in fuel mileage and how they're performing. Well, I had some owner-operators that weren't so happy with me because they said, listen, I'm an owner-operator. I don't work for your company. Uh, you shouldn't be posting my data up on the, on the bulletin board. And they were absolutely right. I probably shouldn't have done that. But I think what they were really upset about was here the company trucks are getting seven miles per gallon and several of these owner operators were kind of bragging about what kind of fuel mileage they were getting in their 389 Peterbilts and they may have been telling everybody they were getting six and a half but it was actually more like four and a half miles per gallon so it was quite a bit less and I just never really forgot that um, and I think you still run into those people today where they try to tell you that the performance of the vehicle is actually probably better than it really is. And at the end of the day, all it is doing is costing them money to run that vehicle. It doesn't matter what kind of truck you run. It doesn't increase the revenue you can produce with that asset. So you really got to look at things different as you think about leasing a truck from your carrier and taking a deep dive into the numbers and try to figure out 
where that's going to leave you for expenses. Let's throw some numbers at it here just a little bit to kind of illustrate our point. So if you were to run 120,000 miles per year, that's roughly 10,000 miles a month. A truck running five miles per gallon over the course of a year is going to need about 24,000 gallons of fuel at that five miles per gallon uh, to hit that 120,000 miles. And at today's fuel price of three, call it, or let's call it 440 a gallon, uh, you're going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $105,000 in your annual fuel cost for that truck. If we were to look at the typical workhorse today, we talked about the Freightliner Cascadia. If you're running a reefer van operation and you're running trucks of that uh, style and you've got um, a governor on the top speed of the truck, maybe it's 65, 68 miles an hour, you're probably going to expect something like eight miles per gallon out of that vehicle. Over the course of the year, that truck's going to take about 15,000 gallons at eight miles per gallon, and it's going to be a about 65,000 for your annual fuel costs. So think about that, that five mile per gallon truck was 105 versus 65,000. You're talking $40,000 difference in vehicles because of what vehicle that driver chose. And again, it didn't make any more revenue. The fancy truck didn't make you any more revenue. So that $40,000 in fuel is pure expense and cost comes right off your bottom line. Now, truth be told, if you're uh, leased onto a carrier or maybe even you're an independent and you have some solid customer base, you're probably getting a fuel surcharge or fuel rebate of some sort to kind of help you offset your fuel cost. So if you're in that position, uh, the fuel difference may not be that extreme. But even when I sit through my workshops and my classes, we spend time working these numbers out on the, the whiteboard and in class I'll put a calculator in front of every driver that's going through it because I want them to punch in the numbers. I want them to get a real feel for what they're calculating and how they calculate that stuff. But even with the fuel surcharge uh, in place, I think 10 to 15,000 is still a realistic number of what somebody running the big fancy square nose truck could get versus uh, somebody that's chosen an aerodynamic truck. One of the fun things I do in the class uh, after we've had that conversation on fuel mileage and, and the impact of the, the style of the truck, I said, listen, so if, if I could get you to sign up for maybe a Freightliner or a 579 Peterbilt versus the other square nose truck, and I was going to give you that truck and write you a, a check for 15,000 bucks, would you take it? And they're like, oh, yeah, without a doubt. Uh, they kind of get it. But the funny part about that is when they actually call it a few hours later, when they're actually ready to sign papers on a truck and they have to pick which truck uh, they want, it's like the ego kind of creeps in and all of a sudden it's really hard. You, they still, they still pick the fancy square nose truck in most cases. So I, I'm like that too. I, you know, I love great shiny stuff and nice vehicles and things like that. It, it would be a hard one, but that's the purpose of going through these workshops and doing all this education. And again, is to try to get people to think just a little bit different. Your decisions now are impacting you and your family and your annual income. And again, if that's ten or fifteen thousand dollars per year just by selecting this truck versus that truck. I think that's a really wise business decision. And that's really what we're trying to understand and see through the workshop process, through the education process, is did we get these folks to kind of kind of flip that switch in their mind and, and think like a small business owner uh, versus a company driver? One of the other things you need to consider uh, we hadn't talked about yet is the serviceability of the truck. And this is probably going to depend on wherever your fleet is located, wherever your home terminal is, or maybe even your home base. For instance, um, I think I mentioned Freightliner is kind of the, the workhorse of the industry. Uh, they own uh, a good part, like last, last I knew it was 45, 47% of the, the trucks out on the road were Freightliners. Uh, Peterbilt and Kenworth combined. Um, maybe made up 20 some percent and then you've got Volvo's Max and some of the others uh, behind that but the reason the Freightliners are so popular specifically with the larger fleets 
is because they have dealerships all over the country and that ability to get these trucks in, get them serviced, the parts availability. So you have to think about that too. If the fleet you're looking at happens to offer multiple brands of trucks, what dealership is in the hometown of the terminal or what dealership is in your hometown or where you live? Because it's a, it's a case of when I'm home with the family and the truck needs something, can I drop it off at the dealership? Is it convenient for me uh, so I can get it repaired while I'm on my home time versus, you know, maybe the ne- that dealership, maybe you picked Peterbilt and the, the closest Pete dealer is 100 miles away. Well, now you got to figure out how to shuttle the truck there, wait for it, go pick the truck up when it's done. And it's just more time lost uh, when you think about that kind of stuff. The bottom line is there's really no right or wrong answer here when we think about this. Um, I just want you to know that looking good can sometimes come at a cost. And I want you to be aware of what that cost is and make sure that goes into your decision making uh, when you're picking out a lease truck from your carrier or if you're looking at a new carrier to lease from. Uh, It doesn't just impact you, it's gonna impact the dollars you're able to take home to the family. And I'm pretty sure if we brought your spouse into into the mix or the question and asked her or him that, He would probably pick the one that's going to bring the most money into the family and into your business. Thanks for joining us on this episode. Leave us a comment on what you'd like to hear about in the trucking industry. And don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode of Driven Too Far, The Truth About Trucking.